Hello and welcome to this webcast, which is part of the Leadwire series on alcohol and health. I'm here with Tanya Sigritz. She is professor at Curtin University and leads the alcohol policy research team at the National Drug Research Institute in Australia. Professor Sigritz, many thanks for taking the time. And in your recent paper um, entitled Alcohol and Risk of Injury in the Journal of Nutrients, we can read that more than 300,000 people died of alcohol-related injuries in 2019. The actual figure could well be higher. And in your paper, you provide a comprehensive uh, review of the recent literature on alcohol and the risks of physical injury. Clearly, the amount of alcohol consumed is a, is a, is a key driver in injury rates. But are you still hopeful that alcohol-related injuries can be reduced with the right interventions? And this not just in Australia, but in all countries where alcohol is consumed broadly. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Alistair, for having me um, on your program. Look, I'm always hopeful. I'm, a, I'm trying to be a positive person. I've been doing this research for close to 30 years, and I'm always hopeful that uh, eventually um, policy and practice will catch up to the evidence even if that's not entirely realistic. But look, um, absolutely no doubt about it. There's a great deal of room for improvement. Um, and I think though that um, there are several areas where uh, inroads are just begging to be made and road injury is one of those areas and uh, probably um, where the most immediate and substantial uh, reductions can be made very quickly without much need to generate new evidence or effectiveness. There's, you know, plain dozens of studies that will point to effective interventions, which are really quite simple um, around alcohol and drink driving. Mm -hmm. And that includes strategies that are specifically targeted at the drink driver. Um, 0.05, for instance, you know, mm -hmm. legal blood alcohol levels for driving, not being able to consume, at, in Australia, we have 0.05 and below is legal, but that is not is illegal, and it's the same for the whole country. It's highly effective when enforced and well publicised. It does need to be enforced, and people do need to understand that there's a high risk of being detected if they break those regulations. But also, there are other strategies that can influence drink driving as well as violence, which are more general population-based rather than targeted. And they can all have meaningful impacts. Um, of course, we are at a point where uh, I think it's less than, well, less than five or 10 percent of uh, middle to low income countries have adopted uh, drink driving legislation. Mm. So uh, what we would expect to be a uh, minimum practice in many countries. And but I think they've been watching and governments are becoming aware of the cost savings and the savings in human lives that can be made by uh, implementing such regulations. But there has to be a will, obviously, a political will, and I think you know, a public will as well. But oftentimes, politicians will respond to public pressure. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's the best way to get them to change their outlook. <laughs> you just mentioned the costs. So in many countries, it appears that the healthcare costs um, mm that result from alcohol-related injuries cannot be actually covered by the income from alcohol taxation. So is there a form of unfair distribution? In other words, should the taxes on alcohol be increased to account for the healthcare-related um, costs? It's certainly an argument that has been made uh, mm. for decades. Uh, there's definitely a very strong logical rational argument for having volumetric based alcohol taxation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, taxation is um, drawn, we call excise tax here in Australia, is mm -hmm. based around the alcohol content of a beverage per unit. Uh, we don't actually, um, just to take Australia as an example, have across the board volumetric tax. There are some beverages here in Australia, wine mostly, which is taxed preferentially but uh, there is vast amount of evidence 
to indicate that when you do increase the price of alcohol via taxation, one route, that that is a good way of um, reducing consumption. But not only is it a good way of reducing consumption, it's an excellent way of generating revenue, as you suggest, for um, finance and treasury departments. And there have been some instances, and I evaluated one uh, about 15 years ago, where those the money raised from a special tax implemented on all alcoholic beverages above 3% alcohol went towards treatment and prevention programs, specifically around alcohol. And that's what we call hypothecated tax. It's actually not very popular with politicians because they like to have the freedom to be able to spend that revenue on what they like and what the pressures are at the time. But your point about um, the cost of alcohol and the taxes on the industry um, not matching the harms that are produced by those products. Now, these are dangerous. This is, the alcohol is part of the dangerous consumption industry along with tobacco and sugar, if you like, as well. Um, it certainly doesn't match the harms, the cost of the harms. And, in fact, it's not just um, the cost to government or, or co cost to taxpayers, if you like, because where's taxpayers fund the governments, but also we pay as individuals. Yeah. So when the cost of alcohol-related harm is increases or whatever, our insurance increases. So increases. insurance on our car, our health insurance mm -hmm. goes up. All these, uh, you know, uh, the, the costs of these are all based around risk or estimates of risk or likelihood. And so when you have a widely consumed product like alcohol, which has so many potential downsides, that immediately and directly figures into the cost for individuals and for society. In addition to pricing interventions, mm -hmm. if you had to you know, select the strategies um, to, to, that are most effective in, in reducing alcohol attributable injuries, um, mm -hmm. what would be further on your list? Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, price is certainly right at the top of the list and one way of uh, achieving changes in price governments can implement quite easily is through taxation. Mm. We talked about volumetric tax. There's also minimum unit price, which is very popular now, which is not in fact a tax, but is about setting a minimum, a floor, by, through which the industry cannot sell alcohol any cheaper. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so at the moment, for instance, take Australia again as an example, you can sell alcohol um, that you can buy uh, a cask wine, so a box of cheap wine, sort of tends to be low quality, for around about 30 Australian cents per standard drink. Oh. It's much cheaper than you can buy water, yeah. bottled water <laughs> or orange juice. It's remarkable, really. And that, that's, that's, there's a long history behind why that is the case and why that is so cheap. Um, but um, there's been lots of new evidence and um, particularly generated from Sheffield University and but also some new studies here in Australia about what happens if you make that floor price a dollar or a dollar fifty that you can't sell any alcoholic beverage for less than a dollar fifty no more of this 20 cents business and uh, of course immediately you see reductions in particularly among the heaviest drinkers because mm -hmm. they like to drink the cheaper alcoholic beverages um, and it reduces, has a, a remarkable effect on um, social harms from alcohol and cost. Mm -hmm. But to move away from cost, which is actually your question, um, there's quite a bit we can do around physical availability as well. So price is about economic availability, mm -hmm. fundamentally. So what can you afford to buy as, you know, in relation to your disposable income? But, what, but also physical availability and how easy is it to access alcohol? Um, is it available on every uh, street corner? Do, do a, what, what's, what's my convenience cost of gaining access to alcohol? And that kind of physical cost is actually very well controlled in countries like Scandinavian countries where they have alcohol monopolies or partial monopolies. They have very good regulatory control over physical availability as well as price. So um, System Belaget in Sweden is a good example um, where they control um, the off trade or the liquor store trade very um, well. And so they dictate how 
frequently or how often there are places where you can purchase alcohol. Mm -hmm. So how many outlets per square kilometre or per person, for instance. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call outlet density. So this is one way of reducing or addressing um, alcohol availability is to reduce the number of physical outlets where people can buy alcohol, right? But if it's available in every hairdresser's or every uh, fuel station or every supermarket, then it is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So there's um, it, people will consume more. Mm. It's easier to access. The other is um, trading hours. So another way to influence physical availability is to reduce the amount of hours through which alcohol can be sold. I, I, it's actually an area where I did a lot of work in my early days as a researcher is around what we call extended trading hours. And uh, we were able to show what happens when you increase trading hours after midnight just by a matter of one or two hours. So where a normal closing time was called midnight for, say, a bar or a restaurant or a nightclub, and then it was extended to 1 a.m. or 2 a.m., we see very large increases in alcohol-related violence and road crashes, which, were, which are out of step with the increase in time. And the reason why that is, and, and it's, it's more than you would expect by just the sheer amount of time that people are drinking, is because when people are allowed to drink into the early hours of the morning, it's not only the alcohol consumption that comes into play in terms of risk of injury, it's fatigue which starts to play a role. So then you're combining fatigue with higher blood alcohol concentrations because people have been drinking for longer. That accumulates. Exactly right. And, you know, we're still animals, we're still human beings, you know, we circadian rhythms and you mess with that with alcohol mm -hmm. by encouraging people to drink from 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. and you see it immediately in drink driving fatalities, violence, violence that occurs in the nighttime environment and violence that occurs in the domestic environment. Mm -hmm. So even just a matter of hours can make an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not particularly hard for policymakers to implement, actually. It's something that's been tweaked and retweaked in many countries. You mentioned the policy makers then, so the increasing the minimum unit price should also be aligned to some of the interests of the alcohol producers, because it would mean that they can potentially, yes, generate more um, revenue by just selling less. Um, but why do you think that policymakers are still sometimes hesitant or even reluctant to, to change um, uh, things and, 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 and work towards protecting citizens. You were absolutely right. The minimum unit price, to be clear, is not a tax. Mm. It is uh, for the increased, um, well, the money made on the increased uh, price accrues directly to the producer. To the, the producer, yeah. That's right. Um, nothing to public coffers. So in that way, it, you know, it has it has a downside. So my argue you were just making more money for the alcohol mm. industry. Is that a good idea? <laughs> but but consumption also declines at the same time. So it's perhaps mm. not as much as you think, but it is still in the positive. Uh, and you're right, it is quite a puzzle. Uh, we, we can talk about possible reasons, maybe another time, why the alcohol industry itself doesn't get behind the idea. Mm. Um, I just, it's, it's probably a rather complicated mix. And the other thing is, you know, the alcohol industry is not one industry, two. It's many different players with many different perspectives mm. on uh, what their role is. So, you know, there's the, the producers and the sellers, there's the retailers, there's the on, there's the off, there's the wine people, the spirits people. So they're not all the same thing. It's very complicated. But I think in to answer your question about why our democratically elected representatives don't always act in what appears to be our best public health interest is the short answer is because they have many masters right, mm. that I imagine. I've never been a politician, but I can imagine the pressures. Um, and it's very rare, in fact, I've only seen it once, really, once or twice in my lifetime as a researcher, where the health concerns are at the top of the list, that long list of competing interests, and that's been clear in some countries during the pandemic. All of a sudden, health has been elevated to the very top. But even while, while the pandemic's been on, we've seen uh, behaviours of the alcohol industry trying to position itself for the best possible outcomes for themselves. For instance, having alcohol deemed a, um, uh, a necessary or a, you know, a fundamental product in many countries 
So, so while everything else was closed down, you could still buy alcohol. If you want to join some countries. Um, so the alcohol was in there. The alcohol industry was in their best interest to make sure that you know alcohol was deemed an essential product. It's remarkable really when you think about that. But anyway, um, aside from that, I think there are many pressures. So alcohol researchers and public health people, I think we um, make a mistake when we assume that all politicians need to see is the excellent evidence which we provide them with about the effectiveness um, of strategies and programs and policies because um, that might get us to, um, I have a friend who works in public health advocacy and he said evidence might get us to first base but it will air, very rarely ever get you a home run. So there's so many more other things that you need to do in addition to present the research evidence around, you know, okay, uh, government, if you extend the licence trading hours by two hours, I can tell you that there's a high likelihood that you'll increase the problems for um, uh, mums and dads and children and road crashes and everybody will be drinking more. Uh, but they also have uh, concerns about the tourism industry. For instance. They might believe, for instance, that if we curtail trading hours, that tourists won't come to our popular holiday destinations because they can't drink till 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm not sure that's true, but often that's the arguments, one of the arguments put to them. Or they might, you know, think it might be bad for business or it'll reduce revenue. Or even if we showed evidence that in the longer term there would be large savings. And I think that's probably the next barrier is that some of the benefits, not so much with industry uh, in, uh, injury, but with a lot of the chronic harms, for instance, like alcohol-related cancers or stroke or heart disease, um, the the social and economic benefits from those might not be realised for five years, mm -hmm. maybe 10 years. So you think of a political cycle being four years, three years, right? So I think that it may, you know, you, you can forgive politicians for thinking in terms of uh, re-election. What's going to be the out exactly the outcome of the next two to three years? Yeah. Why should I think beyond that? Well, I'm really care about is getting in and then you know the next election yeah right so um the interesting thing about injury is that you know because it is what we call an acute or a short-term harm the benefits tend to appear very swiftly almost immediately mm -hmm. um, when you reduce consumption at a population level um, but as we say you know there are many other pressures that our elected representatives are under Professor Sigrid, thank you so much for sharing um, all this with us today and for speaking on this important topic with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, my pleasure.